Come on, stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. Shout out to all of you watching online. I want you to go with me to the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 2. I'm going to look at verses 23 through 28, and then we'll go all the way into Mark chapter 3. The gospel according to Mark. Do you like who you're standing next to? Because okay, if you don't, you can move in the name of social distancing. Be like, hey, <laughs> six feet, six feet. Let me go over here. Mark chapter 2. Look at what it says. It says, one Sabbath... Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? And in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal the man on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. One version says hard hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. The Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Who remains standing? We're going to pray, but can we just pause and address the crazy in the text? How is it that they're in the church service? A man's hand is healed and restored. Everybody starts clapping and praising God, including the man who, by the way, couldn't clap before. And while everybody is clapping, the Pharisees are plotting on how they can kill Jesus. Whoo, that's crazy. That is crazy. It's crazy how that man's healing is what initiated the plot to kill Jesus. I was playing around with titles, so you know I play around with titles. I almost titled this message, When Healing You Is Killing Me. That would have been a good one. That would have been a good one. You know, pastor started, pastor started the series about his upgrade to Vegas. And I was like, you know, I could preach from the title, How to Win with a Bad Hand. <laughs> but I ain't going to do that one either. <laughs> but the thing, the thing that got Jesus angry was their hard heart. I want to preach today from this idea, upgrade my heart. Upgrade my heart. Let's pray. Father, upgrade our hearts and help that person put their phone on silent. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm playing, no condemnation. <laughs> upgrade my heart. That's the series we're in, Upgrade. And let's just talk about Upgrade. How many of you love the screens in here? Come on. Brand new screens. Look at, look at the clarity of those screens. That is LED. I bet you can even, you know, I've had this zit on my forehead for like the last three weeks. Zoom in. I bet you can see the zit on my forehead because those screens look so good. Oh, I don't know what that has to do with my sermon. Anyway, um, one of the things that I've been saying repeatedly, repeatedly since services and churches have been reopening and regathering is how incredible it's been to worship together. I'm telling you, how many know the church is essential? This is essential. It has been amazing to be able to worship together with you, even though some of y'all sing off key. It's just awesome <laughs> to worship with the saints and 
Another thing I've loved is being able to see the faces of the people that I'm preaching to. I'm telling you, I love to be able to see your face when I'm preaching. Now, don't get me wrong. It is lonely up here. It is so lonely on this stage. But it is not as lonely as it was, pre, uh, you know, during the pandemic when I was in rooms, in sanctuaries alone, preaching to cameras and looking at a lens, hoping that what I was saying was resonating on the other side. Ooh, I'm just glad to have faces in the place. It's actually interesting. If you think about it, I have a vantage point that many of you don't have in this room. In fact, none of you have in this room. Because I can see you. If I look at that screen, I can see me. You can see me, but you can't see yourself. Ooh, think about that just for a moment. You have no idea what you look like right now. You don't know what you look I know some of you don't know what you look like, in fact. <laughs> But part of the trick of communication and preaching is you really have to have your mind like steel because some of y'all make some faces that make me think you don't like what I'm saying. But I've learned not to project words onto your face that sometimes you're not mad, you're not constipated, you're just thinking about what I'm saying. But I think that's interesting that you can't see yourself. You can't see you right now. In fact, what's funny is when they were zooming in on my zit, zooming in on my zit, how many know a zit? It could have been forming on your forehead at the exact same moment, and you would have known there was a zit on your forehead till you got home or until you looked in the bathroom mirror, because it's interesting when you're zooming in on somebody else's zit, you can't see your zit. When you're looking at somebody else, you can't see yourself. You can't see yourself. And I think that's important because we're talking about upgrade, upgrading our lives. And I'm finding out that God cannot upgrade what you are unaware of. He cannot upgrade what you are unaware of, what you don't know, what you cannot see. That's why awareness must precede the upgrade. I got to know what needs to be upgraded in my life, and how can I know when I can't see myself? How can I know what needs to be addressed? Because that's what we actually lost in the garden. You know we lost self-awareness. When sin entered the world, that's what we lost. We lost God consciousness. We became self-conscious. We didn't know where we were. That's why when God encountered Adam and Eve, his first question was not how are you, it was where are you because we lost awareness. You can't see yourself. It's interesting. I was talking to a leader not too long ago, and I'll never forget the conversation because I was asking him all these questions about leadership, and he was giving me all kinds of nuggets, and he said something I'll never forget. I was asking him questions. And he was telling me about a question that he often asked of his wife, of his kids, of the people that he leads. He said, I ask this question all the time. He said, here's the question. I always ask them, bless you, I always ask them, <laughs> what is it like to be on the other side of me? What is it like to be on the other side of me. He said, because Robert, that is the only thing I don't have perspective on. I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of me. He said, I got to ask people that I love and that care about me, and then when they tell me the truth, I got to have the humility to hear what they're saying because I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of me. I can't see myself. Like some of you in here today, you're like, I don't need this series. I don't need an upgrade. I'm a good husband. How do you know? You're not married to yourself. I don't need this series. I'm a good parent. How do you know? You've never parented yourself. What is it like to be on the other side? I'm a nice boss. How do you know? You ought to put an intercom in the break room. You'll see what it's like to be on the other side of you. You can't see yourself. And how can God upgrade what I am unaware of? So sometimes I've got to get into community and I've got to get into the presence of God and say, God, help me see the things that I cannot see because I don't know what it's like to be on the other side of me. As a matter of fact, don't let me live my life looking at everybody else's life, seeing what they need to upgrade, that I dismiss the things in my life, come on somebody, that I need to upgrade. Because uh, it's easy to see what everybody else needs to upgrade and totally bypass what you need to upgrade. Let me say it like a preacher. How many of you know mirrors are way better than microscopes? It's better that you look in the mirror at you 
and to start looking at the microscope at everybody else and what they need to fix. And this is really the problem with the Pharisees in my text today. The Pharisees' issue is that they were real good with microscopes. They could see with detail everybody else's problem, but they didn't do well with mirrors. They could never see themselves. And so that's why they kept getting into conflict with Jesus, because Jesus had a way of showing them who they really were. I feel like I'm preaching better than y'all are talking in here today. Can you bring me some of that water, Dad? He, he, he always had problems with the Pharisees because they were real good at microscopes. Couldn't pull a Michael Jackson and look at the man in the mirror. Man in the mirror. What, what, what were the Pharisees' issue with Jesus? There was actually a lot of issues, um, but one was bigger than the other. The, the, the biggest issue is they were just jealous of Jesus. Amen. Let's get to the root of it. They were jealous because how many know when you are effective at what you do, people will get jealous. Amen. Have you noticed? Amen. In fact, what somebody once said that jealousy is the trophy that mediocrity gives to excellence. That whenever you do what you do well, please expect people to be jealous of you. In fact, stop crying about people that are jealous of you or critics of you. That's a sign that you're effective. That's a sign you're doing what God has called you to do. If you don't want critics, say nothing, be nothing, and do nothing. But how many know when you start doing what God has called you to do, people will get jealous. You will have critics. They were jealous. Another issue they had was his claims, the claims of Jesus. Because Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God, and they couldn't understand it. They said, if you were really the Son of God, first of all, we know where you came from. And nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Come on, don't act brand new. Ain't no way you're the Son of God. We know your hometown. Another reason they didn't believe his claim as the Son of God is because of the people that he hung out with. You know, Jesus had a reputation for hanging out with people that had a bad reputation. You understand that they were attracted to Jesus. Jesus would eat with messed up, dysfunctional, broken people that had records. I'm talking about people that had long records. He would eat with them. And in that day, to eat with somebody was to embrace them, was to accept them. That's why you got to be careful. I'm always shocked about how some people will dismiss somebody's life and pull up their record as if their life didn't matter. How many of you know Jesus hung out with some people that had messed up, broken records? So be careful who you talk about just because you say, did you see the facts? Do you know they record? Jesus hung out with people all the time that had jacked up records. And the Pharisees said, if you were really holy, you wouldn't hang out with them. But those, 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 those weren't the big issues. You know what the biggest issue that they had was that Jesus kept doing stuff on the Sabbath. Ooh, that was it. That, that's what got Jesus crucified, is that they kept, he kept doing miracles. He kept doing work on the Sabbath. That was their sensitive issue because how many know the Sabbath was serious to the Pharisees? It was serious to the Jews. Come on. The Sabbath was implemented in Genesis chapter 2. It was God who after six days of creating the world and said all of it's good, but on that last, that seventh day, he ceased. He rested. They did not play with the Sabbath. It was serious to them. How you know, it's still serious to Jews today. Oh, they don't play with the Sabbath. I learned this the hard way. I learned this the hard way. i never forget when I went to uh, Israel for the first time, the Holy Land, and uh, it was on the, one of the days on the Sabbath, and we did a whole day of sightseeing, and it was hot in Israel, hot, okay? So I'm drinking a whole lot of water, making sure I'm staying hydrated, and uh, I missed the bathroom stop, and we're on the bus, and I've got to get to the hotel real fast, real fast, because I've been drinking water all day. We get to the hotel. I am I'm pushing people out the way. I get all the way to the elevator. I don't even look at the elevator. I push the button. The thing just opens up, and I push my floor. I think I was like on the eighth floor and didn't light up. I said, whatever, but the door closed. That elevator stopped on the first floor. I got to use the bathroom real bad. It stopped on the second floor. I had a whole lot of water. It stopped on the third floor. I'm dying on the elevator. It stopped on the fourth floor. It stopped on the fifth floor. On the sixth floor, I blacked out. On the seventh floor, seventh floor, it's none of your business what happened on the seventh floor. And then finally, finally, I get to the eighth floor. I'm dying. I get out of the elevator. I go into my hotel room, come back out, catch the same elevator, and that thing stopped on every floor all the way down. I was so mad. I said, I need to speak to the manager. This don't make no sense. I pay a lot of money to walk where Jesus walks, and y'all can't fix this elevator. It's stopping on every single floor. 
Somebody stopped me on the tour, and they said, what's the problem? I said, the problem is they need to fix that elevator, and I'm going to talk to the manager and make sure something's done about it. They said, Robert, it's the Sabbath. I said, I don't care what day it is. I said, how did it stop on every floor? They said, Robert, that's the Shabbat elevator. I said, I don't care what they named the elevator. I'm trying to figure out why did it stop on every floor. They said, Robert, that, that the Sabbath, that the Sabbath, you don't work, and to push a button is work. So that's why it stopped on every single floor. You think that's crazy? Now you should see what happened back then. They had all kinds of added rules because all God says was don't work on the Sabbath. But the Pharisees said, no, we need to define what not working is. And you should see the list that they had adding to what God never even said. They said you can only take 1,999 steps. They said if you threw some in the air, you could not catch it with that same hand. That's work. You got to catch it with the other hand. You couldn't carry a needle to sew on the Sabbath. You couldn't light a candle on the Sabbath. You couldn't blow out a candle on the Sabbath. You couldn't wash your hair on the Sabbath because the water might get on the ground and you'll have to clean up the water and that's work. You couldn't write a letter on the Sabbath. They had all kinds of rules. and Ladies, you couldn't look in the mirror on the Sabbath because you might see a gray hair and if you picked out the gray hair, that's work. I'm telling you what the Bible said. There's all kinds of rules and you couldn't even heal on the Sabbath. Couldn't heal on the Sabbath. All these rules, all these regulations, and here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus in the middle of all their rules and all their traditions. And that's why I don't understand people that say, I feel like God is just looking at me, waiting on me to break a rule that hit me upside the head. No, I came to tell you, you serve a God that broke rules to redeem you, that destroyed barriers to restore you, that came through all kinds of rules and traditions to make sure your soul could be redeemed. He said, I don't care what that Sabbath says. Let me tell you how gangster I am. Luke chapter 13. <laughs> There's a woman that's got an infirmity. She's been bent over for 18 years. Can you imagine 18 years, not just with a sickness, but a spirit of infirmity for 18 years? And she encounters Jesus, and he says, daughter, stand up, and he lays his hands on her. And all of a sudden, her back is restored, and everybody started praising God except for the Pharisees because she got healed on the, on the Sabbath. John chapter 5, there's a pool. There's a pool at Bethesda, and all these jacked up people are all around the pool, all kinds of issues. Because how many of you know people with the same dysfunctions find each other? Have you ever noticed that? Liars find each other. You know, cheaters find each other. It's just like a magnet, and they're all hanging out in one spot. And there's a guy who's been there 38 years, 38 years, and they would stir the water ever so often. And whoever got in first would get healed. And this guy, for 38 years, years. Never got his healing. I preached this text when I was like 18 years old, and I remember I had an attitude with the dude. I had an attitude with the dude because, you know, Jesus said to him, do you want to get well? But we don't know Jesus' vocal intonation of how he said it. So I preached it like Jesus said it with attitude. Do you want to get well? That's how I preach Jesus saying it. Because I'm going 38 years, bro, come on, 38 years. You could at least like rolled your way by the pool and just been right there to be close to get in 38 years. So I preached it with attitude. I just like, do you want to get well? But that was when I was like 19 or 18. Now I'm close to 38. And I know what it's like to have some issues that you got to say, Lord, I'm still working on some stuff. Oh, y'all going to look at me with that religious face. Don't act like you ain't got some stuff that you keep coming to God saying, please, I, it's the same thing. And I love it because I think Jesus just said to him, hey, do you want to get well? With a smile, do you want to get well? Because today is your day, and I don't care how long it's been that you've been dealing with this issue, today is your day that you can get up and walk again. How many are thankful? It doesn't matter how long it's been, an encounter with the real and living God. <laughs> Change everything. Get up, take your mat, and walk. And he did it, started walking. No <laughs> problem, he was walking on the Sabbath. Remember John chapter 9? Are you bored? There's a guy who's born blind, born blind from birth. And the disciples are walking with Jesus and ask the most asinine question of somebody who is suffering. They said, Jesus, why is he blind? They don't pause to actually hear from God. 
they assume that it has to be one of two reasons. Who sinned? Him or his parents? And Jesus goes, uh, neither. I like the message translation. He goes, y'all are asking the wrong question. He said, you think that his suffering is connected to sin or his personal sin, and that is not the case here. Now, how many know there are some times that your suffering is directly connected to some sin, and you blame the devil, and the devil's looking at you like, oh, that wasn't me, that was you. <laughs> there are some times that is the case, but Jesus said, not in this scenario. Please do not connect his suffering to some type of sin. He said, this happened so that the glory of God, so that the power of God may be revealed in his life. Come on, I need to tell somebody in 2020 that's been going through some suffering, please don't let the enemy come in your mind and make you think it's because something you did. Could it be possible that this year is a setup for God to reveal his glory in your life, for God to show you that when you ain't got the money, he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider. For God to show you that yes, your job was your resource, but I'm your source, and I'm going to make sure you got everything you need. Oh, y'all too quiet for me. Would you take 10 seconds and give God some praise like you know he's going to get the glory out of your life, the glory out of this year, the glory out of the church. This is the church's finest hour. Hallelujah! This happened so the glory of God could be revealed. This happened so his power could be shown. Oh, and that man got a mud sandwich from Jesus in his eyes, told him to go wash it off. The problem is he did the washing and the walking on the, on the Sabbath. And each time it happened, the Pharisees got more mad. That's what they are to the Pharisees. Fair I see. Fair I see. I see. I see. It's funny preaching about the Pharisees in church because especially people who have been raised in church. It's because when you've been raised in church and you're people preaching about the Pharisees who regularly attended church, it's funny how the people who regularly attend church never think they're the Pharisees in the text. <laughs> if it, come on, you know you ain't never typecast yourself as the Pharisee in the text. We always typecast ourselves as the person that's hurting, no, that's broken, don't we? Or we typecast ourselves as Jesus, right? And the Pharisees just become a metaphor for our haters, <laughs> i.e. the people that don't agree with us and whose philosophies don't line up with ours. Yeah, Jesus had haters. You know, I got haters too. Pharisees have... You don't never see yourself as the Pharisee. I don't ever see myself as the Pharisee. But perhaps another question besides what's it like to be on the other side of me, maybe you should ask when you look at a text like this, where's the Pharisee in me? Where's the Pharisee in me? Because they had an issue that Jesus kept wrecking their tradition. And he kept doing it on the Sabbath. One text, he was like, well, can't you do it on another day of the week? Quit doing it on the Sabbath. So they start, watch this, stalking Jesus to see what he was going to do on the Sabbath. <laughs> Literally stalking. That's what happened in Mark chapter 2. They're in grain fields in stocks of grain. Look how stupid. <laughs> The Pharisees look, shh, <laughs> stalking, following Jesus through a grain field. They don't like him, but they following him. <laughs> they can't stand him, but they following him. Oh, I love how the Bible's for today. They don't like him, but they still following him. Why in the world would you follow me? If you don't like me, why are you fight? Why are you on my page? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Saying stuff. If you don't like me, hit unfollow. But isn't it funny how all the way from the Bible days, people will follow you and don't like you? Preach, Robert. <laughs> if you don't like me, unfollow me. <laughs> they're stalking and they're watching. What are they going to do? And look, I want you to see the disciples. Look at, look at legalism versus, versus discipleship with Jesus. They're quiet. <sighs> Stalking. Shh, be quiet. Look out. Look at that face. <sighs> Shh, can you see? And look at the disciples just hanging in the presence of Jesus. Just having a good time. Jesus, you were preaching today, man. That was good. Having a good time. Just having joy. Having the best time. Like, man, you were preaching so good. Jesus, we didn't even eat. But, well, we in the grain field. Let's get grab a little of this grain real quick. Ah, stop! 
Like, where did they come from? <laughs> They've been following us the whole time. Yeah, we have. And uh, it's against the law for you to eat grain on the Sabbath. I love that the disciples don't say anything. Jesus steps in as their defense attorney. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just shut your mouth and let God fight your battles. Jesus is like, Jesus is like calm, Peter, calm, I got it. He goes to him. He says, uh, have you not read? Have you not read? Y'all are the teachers of the law. Have you not read when David, 1 Samuel chapter 21, was hungry and his companions were hungry and they needed food, but there was no food available except for the consecrated bread that was only reserved for the priests? Don't you remember that? You didn't read that? I love that because he's calling them out on one or two things. Either he's saying, y'all the teachers of the law and you don't read the word. He's like, oh, you're the ones that study the word and you don't read it? Or they read it and he's challenging their interpretation. Because how many you know, it's not enough just to read the Bible or quote the Bible if you got the wrong interpretation. Because you know you can make the Bible say anything. Oh, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Don't just read it. I'll never get intimidated by people like quotes chapter and verse. I, just Satan quoted scripture. It's not, it's not a question, can you read it? It's have you interpreted it properly? You can make the Bible say anything. Come on, you, you could have got alone in quarantine and you live with somebody and you're not married and you'd be like, well, you know, you know, Ecclesiastes 4.11 says, you know, if one is warm, how can you be warm except you lay with somebody else? So, you know what I'm saying? I don't want you tripping for. You can make the Bible say whatever you want. You can make it say whatever you want. Be struggling, be like, man, I just really had a bad day. Pastor Hennessy talked about Hennessy. Man, you know, you know, Paul told Timothy, get a little wine for your stomach. Uh, my stomach don't feel too good. Is there? Make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Not just reading it. Is this, this <laughs> the right interpretation? Because misreading and misinterpreting can mess you up. Oh, it can mess you up. Are y'all bored yet? I, I remember hearing this story, I have to share this story because, you know, Social Dallas, we meet at the Granada Theater, and we got, it's like a rock venue. There's this story that's popular about, and some of y'all super saved, you listen to, you know, Hillsong all the time, so excuse this illustration, but uh, the, the rock group Van Halen, there's a story that went out about Van Halen, talking about the power of reading and interpretation. There's a story that's circled around about the rock group Van Halen for years, and the story is that the lead singer of Van Halen one day walks into his dressing room and sees M&M's in the dressing room, and he sees brown M&M's in the package, in the bowl. And he flips, and he kicks the door, and the newspaper article that talked about it said he did $100,000 worth of damage because he saw brown M&M's in his dressing room. And some of you are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Well, here's the story behind the story. He had in his writer, Van Halen had in his, their writer, that no brown M&Ms were allowed. Absolutely no brown M&Ms. So much so that if they saw brown M&Ms, they could not pay the promoter. No brown M&Ms. And the problem with that is that they didn't know that the reason that they put no brown M&Ms is because Van Halen did all kinds of stuff with their concert tour. They had all kinds of lights. They had eight semi-trucks come in to set up the stage. The stage had to be a certain amount of weight. One socket had to have the right voltage. And because they kept going to places and they weren't getting the right voltage right because they weren't reading the entirety of their writer, they said, okay, we're going to put in between each one of the details, there must not be any brown M&Ms. So that way, if we walk into the green room and we see brown M&M's, we know this is going to be a messed up night because they didn't take time to read the writer that had the technical stuff. So one night they go to a concert venue and they didn't have time to check the green room and they're on stage and all of a sudden the stage starts to cave in in the middle of their set, put their life in jeopardy, did $80,000 worth of damage. He walks off of the stage, goes into the green room and sure enough sees that there were brown 
M&Ms and turned all the way up and kicked the door and did $12,000 worth, worth of damage. But the newspaper article just said that he did $12,000 worth of damage because he saw brown M&Ms, and that wasn't the case. And what's crazy is he was willing to go for years and let people think that he was psycho just for seeing brown M&Ms and recently reviewed the story. And that's the power of not reading or having the wrong interpretation. And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus said, I'm willing to risk my reputation to show you Pharisees that people are worth more than your programs, that human need always transcends tradition, that it is not about all of your conduct, it's about compassion. And I'm willing to let you think whatever you want about me because you are so caught up in your tradition that your tradition is trampling over people. They go from the grain field all the way into the synagogue. And guess what day it is on the synagogue? The Sabbath. He's in the church, and I can see the setup. They're in a new series called Upgrade. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. Here come the Pharisees, and they're watching because they know it's the Sabbath, and it's a showdown. And I can almost see the Pharisees looking to see if there's broken people in the room because they know that Jesus has this affinity to broken people. He's got to do something no matter what the day is. That's his weakness. He's got to. He can't help himself. If somebody's broken, he's going to bring restoration. If somebody's hurting, he's going to give healing. He doesn't care what the day is. So I can see them looking at Jesus but also scoping the room to see where the broken people are. See, this is what I think the church should look like. We need some jacked up people in the church. It's something wrong if everybody in church looked like they floated in here and had communion for breakfast. I want some people smell like they got a little weed on them before the service. If that's you, you are welcome in this place. You can smell something on their breath. You can tell, you know, they can get, say a little something, man. They might say, beep, service was beeping good today. I like those type of people. Because this ain't a sanctuary for perfect people. This is a hospital for hurting people. And if you want to come in, there's a Savior that says you can come in. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy how people get it messed up and think what this is about. You know how many people walk into Granada Theater, tears on their face, said, I don't want to step into a church, but I came to the Granada Theater. Won't step into church because they dealt with Pharisees. Yeah. And they're watching, saying, he's, no, he's good, he's good, he's good, he's good. And I think he came in late. And they go, shh, hey, we got somebody, we got somebody. Come here, come here, come here. You see him? And they're like, who's that? He's like, that's Willie. You know, <laughs> you know Willie with a withered hand. <laughs> yeah, that's Willie with a withered hand. I'm like, he's like, wait a minute, he's covering up. He does that, but that's Willie, okay? You can't see it under his robe, but I promise you that's Willie with a withered hand. <laughs> Y'all laughing, but isn't that what we do? Yeah. 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 Isn't it funny how people will define you by your defect? That's Willie with the withered hand. That's, that's Sarah with the alcoholism problem. That's, that's John on his eighth marriage. That's him. That's, people will define you by your defect. Willie with the withered hand. He still had another good hand. It's not the dude with the good hand. It's not the good dude with the good eyes or the good legs. No, Willie with the withered hand. Wow. Wow. I think Willie walked in late. Because you know how you do when you got a withered hand and you got an issue and you're coming to a spiritual place, you feel like you got to hide it. You don't want anybody to see it. It's interesting, the word withered is a perfect past tense, which means he was not born with a withered hand. He was not born with this. This was an accident that happened in his past that still carries residue in the present. Anybody know what it's like to have something so painful in your past? I'm talking about years ago. But you're still dealing with the residue of it. And he walks in and he probably hides it. Luke says, Dr. Luke says it's his right hand, his hand of strength. 
It was the right hand that you would shake hands with. It was the right hand you would pronounce a blessing. It was disrespectful to reach out your hand with your left because of hand sanitization issues. You didn't reach with your, you did other things with your left hand. This man has never shook anybody, shaken anybody's hand. He would just come in like this. And it's interesting, I went to school, Pastor Tim, with somebody that had a withered hand. Had a withered hand, went to school with him. And what's funny is the first day I met him, I saw the withered hand. But I'm telling you, that withered hand did not slow him down. He was the star player on our football team. After a while, I didn't even notice it. Because it's not like a blind eye. It's not like a bad leg. How many of you know? You don't get around with the withered hand. Your withered hand is the thing that you've learned to live with. It's the dysfunction that you have come to the conclusion, this will never change. This is who I am. And you don't think God can upgrade that. I know this man didn't have faith for it because he didn't even open up his mouth when he came into the synagogue. He's not like the woman with the issue of blood who pressed her way through. He's not like blind Bartimaeus who said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. How many of you know Jesus had supernatural power? Anybody that had a need, they did not hesitate to open up their mouth and let God know what they needed. Come on, nobody ever healed like Jesus. Every single person that came to him experienced his powerful healing. So if he wanted to be healed, he would have said, hey, Jesus, is Willie here? My hand. No, he, he didn't expect it. He said, let me just come into the synagogue and hear a sermon. You'd be shocked at the people who say, I just came to hear a cute message. I'm just watching online because God can't upgrade this. But God told me to preach this message and tell you he wants to upgrade the very thing that you don't think he can upgrade. He wants to upgrade the thing that you have learned to live with, the dysfunction you've gotten comfortable with. God says, I want to bring my power to that. Yeah. Didn't want to be seen. And the Pharisees are watching. Can you see them? They're watching. And Jesus is watching them watch him. And it's a, it's a battle of the eyes. They're looking like, you going to heal him? <laughs> Jesus looking like, you don't think I will? <laughs> Willie! <laughs> Stand in front of everybody. Puts him in the center of the room. Once he puts him on display, then he addresses the Pharisees. I'm going to ask the worship team to join me. You understand that every miracle of Jesus is a parable. When you have supernatural power to heal anybody, you can heal all kinds of ways. The way you do it is teaching something. Every miracle is a parable. And I think Jesus was trying to get these Pharisees to see that what's wrong with this man's hand is what's wrong with your heart. He's got a withered hand that you can see. You've got a withered heart that is dead, and you think you're spiritual, but nobody can see it. You do know even in technology, every upgrade, there's hardware upgrades that you can see, and there's software upgrades that you can't see at all. He's like, you need your heart upgraded? puts him on display and asks him a critical question. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? To save a life or to kill a life? That's what he asked him. I love it because they came to trap Jesus and put him on trial. Jesus reverses the situation, puts them on trial, and calls Willie as his witness. <laughs> Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil? To save a life or to kill a life? Look at the simplicity of the question. He said, is that simple? I want you to answer that simple question. I love it because the Pharisees were obsessed with rules. They were obsessed with how far can we go? Can we take this many steps? They had made everything so complex. They had added their traditions to the law of God. They made everything complex. Jesus said, let's make the complex simple. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil? To save a life or to kill? Let's just make the complicated simple. I'm thankful for a Savior 
Savior who makes the complicated simple that when the law came in and there was all kinds of regulations, Jesus said, let's make the complicated simple. I'm going to take you from 613 to 2. Here's what I'm calling you to do. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Work on that. We'll fix everything else later. We'll work on the right outfit later. We'll work on the alcoholism later. But can we work on what this is? Oh, my goodness. I cannot clean a fish until I catch it. So can we work on that? The simplicity. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He simplifies it. He says, is it, is it right to do good or evil, speaking to the man? He says, is it right to save a life or to kill, speaking to himself, knowing in their hearts they were in the synagogue plotting on how to kill God? And the Bible says when he asked the question, they remained silent. They didn't say anything. Hold on, Pharisees, you don't got nothing to say now? You were real loud about the grain popping up out of grain fields. You're real loud about the grain, but you don't got nothing to say about a man with a withered hand. You were so loud about them plucking the grains with their hand, but you don't have anything to say about somebody that is hurting. See, this is the problem with Pharisees. They will pick what they want to be loud about. But can I declare, God has called this church and you and I to be loud about everything. We're going to be loud about abortion. We're going to be loud about brown bodies that are being killed. We're going to be loud about police brutality. We're going to be loud about people that injure and don't respect the police. We're going to be loud about every single thing. That is the call on our life, to be loud about all of it. I'm going to be loud about sex trafficking. I'm going to be loud about homeless. You can't pick and choose what you want to be loud about. They ain't got nothing to say. They remained silent. And Jesus was angry at their hard hearts. He's got a hard heart. You've got a hard heart. He's got a hard hand. Y'all are connecting. Because what you do with your hand started with your heart. The two are connected. And what he was trying to get them to do which is what he ultimately made the man do. Watch this, I'm done. Is he tells a man with a withered hand to stretch your hand. Stretch it. Why would you ask me to stretch it? Jesus, that's ridiculous. If I could stretch it, I would have stretched it before. No, it's different now because I'm commanding you to stretch your hand. And how many know whenever God commands you to do something within the commandment, it's his empowerment to do it. Oh, he wouldn't be commanding you to do it if it wasn't possible. He wouldn't have commanded us to love our neighbors if it wasn't possible. Yes, it might stretch you. Yes, it might make you feel uncomfortable. But how many know sometimes your healing is in your stretching? And if he asks you to do it, that means he's giving you the power to do it. Oh, somebody help me preach. If he commanded you to stretch forth your hand, the Red Sea will split. If he commanded you to walk on water, that means you can do it. If he's commanding you, somebody get up on your feet and give our God some praise in this place today. If he commanded you to do it, within the commandment comes the empowerment to do it. He stretched out his hand and was restored. He was trying to get the Pharisees to stretch their hearts, stretch it past the customs and traditions and see that compassion comes before your conduct code. Relief comes before your rituals. People take precedence over your tradition. Here's my prayer in this day and age. Lord, upgrade my heart. Not my neighbors, not them. Upgrade 
my heart. Don't let me look at a microscope. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. Upgrade my heart, because if you upgrade my heart, strength will come to my hand, and I'll do what you've called me to do, but it starts in my heart. Come on, is there anybody in here that says, I want God to upgrade my heart? Come on, that's what he's calling us to. That's, that's the revival. Come on, that's being birthed. If that's what you want, would you just lift up your hands as the worship team joins us? Come on, just begin to open up your mouth and cry out to God and say, God, upgrade my heart. Upgrade my mind. God, give me a heart for the things that break your heart. God, give me compassion. 